Hi guys, this is jsnl.com and I'm here with the Huawei Nova 10 Pro for a full review and every once in a while I'm going to show you the regular Nova 10 version. Okay, so let's get things going. The price tag in Europe for this handset is 699 euros. It's supposed to be a high mid-range phone and a bit of a flagship killer, especially as far as the main camera is concerned. It's polarizing to see this gold ring here. And, well, that's about it, as far as the controversy goes. Now, as usual, the device doesn't have the Play Store or Google services, but the app gallery has evolved quite a bit. Now, the device saw the light of day in Europe at IFA or IFA 2022 in Berlin, and it's time for a review. Now, the design here is, I would say, pretty straightforward. We have a curved glass facade with a pill-shaped cutout for the front camera and its accompanying sensor. And, of course, this very large golden ring around the main camera. This is a pretty light and slim phone, 7.9mm in thickness and 191 grams in weight. And, sadly, there's no IP certification here. It comes in black, silver, green or violet. It has a matte black with a nice shine to it doesn't draw fingerprints and increases the grip. I would say it's grippier than its rival Honor 70. It feels a bit like sandpaper this texture here and the Nova logo is a bit uh, highlighted and a bit uh, 3D so to say. It's a bit raised from the uh, rest of the backside. The camera protrudes quite a bit which is felt the most when you put the phone on a flat surface. It wiggles quite a bit. The build is solid and uh, the screen is protected by a plastic uh, um, protection from the factory. We have no information about any sort of other um, glass protection. As I promised, I'm also going to show you the regular Nova 10, which is this one here. It's even lighter and a bit smaller, keeps the camera design and the backside design, and at the same time doesn't use a pill for the uh, front camera cutout, but rather a singular punch hole. Once again, uh, the lightness and the slimness are the core attributes of the series. And as you can see, the general aesthetics are very much the same for these two handsets. Okay, I'm going to put aside the Nova 10 for now and go back to the Nova 10 Pro. By the way, if you want a small fellow, you should know that its price tag is 549 euros. The screen, which you're seeing here, it's a 6.78 inch panel of the OLED variety with a resolution of 2652 over 1200 pixels. It has 120 hertz refresh rate and HDR10 plus support, plus narrow bezels, actually narrower than the Nova 9 series. Now the actual viewing experience will be put to the test on YouTube. We have it via GSpace, which we installed from the app gallery. And here we go. Now this is a video, a test video showing you the prowess of the screen. It's immersive for sure, it has narrow bezels, it's very, very bright, crisp and uh, vividly colored. It has uh, wide view angles. And the contrast is rather solid in the sunlight. The screen remains legible uh, text-wise and movie-wise and the camera interface-wise. So pretty happy with the um, visual experience courtesy of this screen. Okay, so uh, we also have some tests for the screen. It has a pixels of the pentile, pentile metrics arrangement variety. And here we have the measurement, which is very impressive. 802 lux units. It's the brightest Huawei I've ever seen. It's a record. It goes above Huawei P50 Pro, iPhone 14 Pro, Galaxy A53 and Motorola Edge 30 Pro. It's only below three other phones, including the Galaxy S22 Plus and some other heavy hitters like the Galaxy S22 Ultra. So, color me impressed by the screen. Now, once we go inside the phone, we're going to find a familiar face, so much so because it was also present on the predecessor. Qualcomm Snapdragon 778G 4G version, 6 nanometer chip we have here. It's an octa-core CPU limited to 4G on account of the Huawei restrictions. It's accompanied by 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage. We don't have a micro SD. We also don't have lag. That's a good piece of news. And going further, you can check out some benchmarks here. In Antutu 9, we scored just above the Xiaomi 12 Lite and Realme 9 Pro Plus. While in Geekbench 5, we managed to surplus the Galaxy S20 Plus and the Poco X3 Pro. In this very same test, we stayed below the Motorola H30, Huawei Nova 9 and Honor 70. In uh, 3D Mark, let's see what we achieved. Let's choose this one. 
we were just above Motorola Edge 20 and Oppo Reno 6 Pro 5G, but below the Motorola Edge 30 and OnePlus Nord 2T. And just as a quick mention, I'll get back to this uh, little fellow here, which has a smaller screen diagonal, pretty much the same CPU and pretty much the same camera setup on the back side. Just so you know uh, what the hardware is and how we're doing here hardware wise. Okay, putting it back and let's talk about the temperature on the Pro fellow. Uh, we go here, then we go here, and uh, when it comes to the temperature in benchmarks, you achieve 34 degrees Celsius, which is by no means overheating. And now let's talk about the battery. Now, as far as battery is concerned, we have here a 4,500 mAh unit with 100 watt wired charging, which is pretty impressive for me. You're supposed to reach between 20 to 80% in just 10 minutes, so you jump from 20 to 80%. You have reverse charging and you don't have wireless charging, just so you know. Okay, so we have here the tests. I'm going to start with the video playback one, which is 15 hours and 13 minutes, which is quite solid for me. Um, at the same time, uh, I should also mention that the actual value should be around closer to 15 hours and 38 minutes. That's how much we actually achieved. Uh, we surpassed Poco F4, Galaxy S21 Fan Edition, but we were below Xiaomi 12X and Moto G82 and the Nova 9. Continuous usage isn't very impressive, just 10 hours and 12 minutes, I've seen better. We may surpass Galaxy S20 Fan Edition and Xiaomi Mi 11, but we're below the predecessor Nova 9 yet again and below the Galaxy A52. The charging is the most impressive part, just 28 minutes from 0 to 100% and in just 5 minutes you are at 26%, 15 minutes 62%, which is very impressive in my book. As far as the acoustics are concerned, we have this bottom speaker here and we also have the earpiece at the top side, even though these three little holes may help with the acoustics as well, not very sure by that, of that, sorry. Uh, there is no audio jack here. Um, the volume doesn't break any records and the speaker at the bottom is a bit more powerful than the one at the top. It basically is doing all the heavy lifting, if you ask me. Okay, let's try to fix the brightness here because it's a bit uh, unstable. And when it comes to the volume, we use an acoustic sample to reach 79 decibels at the top speaker and 81.5 decibels at the bottom speaker. With the bottom value, we surpassed uh, the Honor 70 and OnePlus Nord 2T, but uh, we stayed below the Galaxy A52 and the Poco F4, as well as the Realme 9 Pro Plus. Uh, now, with the multimedia test, which is basically the gaming, we achieved 92.8 decibels, which is underwhelming. It may be above the Xiaomi 11T Pro and uh, the Xiaomi Mi 11 Lite 4G, but it's below hundreds of other phones, including the Galaxy A53 and the Redmi Note 11 Pro. On the camera front, we have here in this pill-shaped cutout, which you can see at the top side, we have a combination of 60 megapixel ultra-wide camera, yes, I know it's impressive, and also a 8 megapixel portrait camera. It films in 4K, while at the back side we have um, 50 megapixel main camera, 8 megapixel ultra-wide, and 2 megapixel camera uh, for macro or bokeh. Now, aside from that, this little fellow, the Nova 10, has the exact same setup at the backside, while the facade keeps the lovely uh, 60 megapixel camera cut at the top side here. So there's that, not that many differences between the two handsets. I should probably also mention that the main sensor here has a setup of the RYYB variety, with the two Ys being yellow, an extra yellow pixel to capture uh, improved colors. We also have a variety of camera modes, which should be pretty interesting for everyone. I mean, we have the vlog features here, which let you combine cameras with the lenses, front and front, front and rear, rear and rear, and several other combos. Plus the effects, we have the AI color, we have portrait video, we have follow focus and showcase focus, to name just a few. And there's the photo section, there's the portrait section, and we also have a night mode. And now let's get to the gallery. Okay, so here we are with the gallery here of the shots we've taken, 285 of them, and once again we have quite a few. Uh, most of them are selfies because this feels very much like a selfie phone. Okay, so we start off here with the sun ray hitting our camera, and this is the ultra wide shot, which is not bad, but at the same time a bit noisy on the size as it usually happens with 8 megapixel cameras. Not a bad zoom considering we're lacking a telephoto camera, and something which I appreciated for this camera setup is the texture in both the trails in the sand and the flowers we caught here.
By the way, the previously mentioned 2 megapixel camera is a bokeh one, not a macro one, and most likely macros are taken with the ultra wide camera. Okay, so the first selfies are in, and I have to say, I love the clarity of the background kept in check as the foreground remains decently well focused. Okay, not the best lighting in this section here, and it's one of the few cameras which lets you zoom in on the subject when taking a portrait shot. That's on account of having two cameras at the front. We go further and we get some beautiful scenario here. I would say that some pictures were a bit too saturated for my taste, but in general I was happy with the color calibration. Once again a few more selfies, although every once in a while I had a feeling that the focus was a bit off and somehow the background behind me was better focused than I was. But that's just an impression, I'm not very sure, it's a constant. Once again, 2x zoom using the camera. One hue that this camera gets right is the red. So the reds are satisfying here, you can see that happening. And also the blues are quite nicely captured. Okay, so even more selfies. What's different about this batch is that it was captured in a very strong sun, as you can see by my squinting. And then I started playing around with a bunch of effects. As you can see here, I'm applying filters and effects, but they tend to make the pictures overly bright. To be honest, the black and white shots are pretty impressive, especially the ultra wide ones, which capture a lot of background scenery. Okay, let's go further and try to find more colorful stuff. Once again, excellent reds and blues. As I mentioned before, the extra yellow pixels really contributes. Surprisingly good macros, and once again, uh, ultra wide camera seems to do that better than a dedicated macro cam. These are the cutout effects, pretty well done, actually partially better than the iPhone ones I've seen recently. And that should be the whole gallery, and once again, a texture shot of a pigeon's feather. So, so far, texture, selfies, the reds and the blues are the core aspects of this camera's prowess. This was daytime, let's go to the nighttime. Well, this time I'm not as impressed as I was during the daytime, however, the night mode is the one that makes the camera really shine. There is noise uh, every once in a while, especially in the ultra wide shots for sure, and if you're using the camera, the selfie camera without waiting, you'll see a lot of noise and darkness. If you wait a bit, there will be activated the activation of the selfie um, display flash, so to say. So basically the screen becomes white, enters into a flash, and the clarity is actually, to be honest, quite impressive, and particularly the eyes are well rendered. It was something like 11 p.m. and still the face was this clear and well lit. Pretty nice. You can see I'm totally focusing on the camera because this is pretty much a selfie phone. And you can see here several other shots uh, with the ultra wide things can go wrong, the lights are uh, exacerbated and there are other problems. You can see that here the image gets a bit softer. But in general, I was happy with what the nighttime shots were able to achieve. Once again, subtracting the ultra wide. Okay, we've talked a lot about photos. Let's also discuss videos. We have an app for that and we have it here. We have quite a few clips and it's actually 33 of them. We even have a slow-mo video. Let's see the most relevant ones. I would have to say that I'm pretty happy with what we achieved here as far as the stabilization is concerned. Okay, so, oh, not, not this one. It's actually this one, I think, yes. Okay, so stabilization test, we're walking up on a slope quite fast, excellent stabilization, not bad colors and saturation all around. Okay, another relevant test is the one involving the focus, which uh, should be here somewhere. Here we go, it's this one, focusing on this small nugget and then on the background and alternating it in a pretty fast and accurate manner. We also have a selfie video while walking. Uh, it's a ultra wide shot as you can see. There's a lot of scenery around me, but considering it's in the shade, it's a bit darker and noisier than the others I took. And when I say others, I do have quite a few. This one here is a special feature which always keeps me centered and focused, no matter how much I wiggle around and move. Could be interesting to see. And then I also tried out this one, which is basically the bokeh video. It's a bit reddish, it's a bit too warm for my taste. But the bokeh effect is pretty nice, even though there are a bit uh, 
uh, there's a bit of an unclarity around my head. And finally, this one, the AI color, it feels like I have a green screen behind me. It's actually, I'm in color and everything behind me is black and white. Those are just some of the features which I tested. The camera is satisfying, even though every once in a while there's a bit of oversaturation, overexposure, and a bit of noise on the sides. We have quite a few videos. We also have nighttime videos like this one. These ones are underwhelming. This is the Achilles heel of the phone for sure. There's some reflection, there's some noise, and even ghosting when you're panning around. And I even tried out the, well, classic walking around stabilization test during the night with not very impressive results. There are also some bluish hues I didn't enjoy. Okay, so we're done with the camera. You remember the strong suits, the basic, the selfie, the stabilization, the reds and the blues, and the macros. Now, as far as the connectivity is concerned, the phone is only limited to 4G for obvious reasons. It has Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, GPS, NFC, and USB-C 2.0 port at the bottom. Now, let's see what else we have here. So, I would say that the calls were pretty loud and clear for me, and let's see what we achieve for the speed tests. We can go here and you can see the results. As far as the Wi-Fi is concerned, 851 mega per second in download and 850 mega per second in upload. We're doing fine. On 4G, we achieved 173 over uh, 58.1 mega per second download and upload respectively. I would say these are decent results. Hopefully Huawei gets its stuff fixed and can give us 5G yet again next year. Okay, so it's software time. Let's talk about software here. We have Emotion UI 12.0.1 and uh, doing a bit of research, we sadly only have Android 11 here, even though I would have liked to see um, Android 12. Okay, so we have here the aggregator, the today view, so to say, which combines news, sports events and so much more. You can actually select what you want to see in this area here and all the services which will be aggregated here. Now, if you pinch the screen, you'll be able to see wallpapers, widgets and transitions. These are the widgets. There aren't the newfangled ones which Android 12 brought and made them larger. They're the old school ones. You can also get some extra options for the home screen, the layout and so forth. And you can also opt to have an app drawer unless you're like me and you want to keep everything on the screen. Now, the security, I'm using the face unlock right now because I have faith in it with two selfie cameras, but there's also a fingerprint scanner in the screen, which is quite snappy. We don't have the Play Store or Google services, but we have the Huawei App Gallery, which has something like 180,000 apps available globally. It's the third biggest app store in the world after the Play Store and the Apple App Store. Now, aside from that, I'm also relying on Gspace here, which allowed me to install stuff like YouTube, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Gmail, Uber, and so much more. And you saw me using YouTube via Gspace, which simulates a phone like the Huawei P30 and Google services in the cloud. Now, what else I can mention here? If you swipe from the left side, you have notifications. If you swipe from the right side, you got your control panel with all the connectivity settings and options, screenshot, dark mode, ebook mode, and the super device, which will connect fast via drag and drop to headphones, PCs, Huawei laptops, and so much more. Um, if you go to the settings, you can find useful stuff. Well, you have connectivity here, super device. You got your always on display with some beautiful customization options. You got your biometrics. You got your security area here with emergency SOS and more. You got your permission manager and private space. Uh, there's also digital well balance and Huawei assistant. For multitasking, you can either do the swipe, the semi swipe for these apps, or you can rely on the sidebar here where you can either trigger an app like this, a floating app, or simply complete an app from here by splitting the screen in two, as I just did. Or you can have them in pairs and keep an app handy here, triggered as a floating app, you can keep it right there when you need it. And you can also resize them and close them and jump between them like this, as if they were a sort of bookmark. Okay, that's about it in a nutshell. Um, as far as the pre-installed apps go, this is the most important one, the optimizer of the resources. We also have some games, we also have some tools, which you see here. Top apps like Office are available, recommendations and so much more. We don't forget about Petal Search, which is basically an alternative to Google Search and a source for nearby restaurants, hotels and objectives, shopping and your own profile, plus Petal Maps, which has become a worthy opponent for Google and Apple Maps. That's about it as far as the phone is concerned and I'm going to put the uh, younger brother or the smaller brother right next to it and draw the verdict. So, uh, the Huawei Nova 10 Pro, this one here, 
has the following pros. On the pro side, very fast charge, an okay grip, it has the brightest screen that Huawei has ever known, and a pretty okay performance from its Snapdragon CPU. The video playback time is uh, sufficient, I would say. We have stereo speakers on board. It's excellent for vlogging on account of the front cameras and a solid main camera here, which sometimes reminds me of the OnePlus Nord 2T. Uh, it takes some nice close-ups, captures the nice red and blues, and also does 4K video like a pretty good mid-range phone. Good stabilization all around. Those are the pros. Now, on the cons, we have a protruding camera quite a bit. This ring, golden ring, may not be to everybody's liking. We don't have an IP certification. There's no Gorilla Glass. The continuous usage is a bit underwhelming, I'll give it that. And the acoustics aren't exactly impressive even though we have stereo. The ultra-wide camera here, if it weren't for the macro, I wouldn't be impressed by it. The night videos were the Achilles heel of the handset. And we only have Android 11 and no Play Store as other drawbacks. In the end, it's a handset for vlogging. It's clear from the large number of selfies I've taken here. It's good for multimedia, though, on account of the very bright screen. Uh, it's got the filming thing with a lot of combos, the front cameras together, the back cameras together, and alternate it. It's a vlogger's phone for sure. A bit pricey, I know, but there are very good initial offers with its launch in Europe, all sorts of vouchers and discounts and bundles. Now, if you want the cheaper version and the smaller version, this has the same cameras at the back side and the same main front camera with a 60 megapixel resolution, so you may want to look into it for about $100 or euros less than Nova 10. In the end, it's a vlogger phone for sure. Stylish vloggers who want to flex with the golden ring around their camera, main camera. That's it from gsno.com. This has been the review of the Nova 10 Pro and partially the Nova 10. Goodbye.